Hello and welcome to the first Defence Side podcast of 2024. We're going to kick off with a look at the defence scene post the general election. We have Vice Admiral Jeremy Blackham, retired, former Deputy Chief of Defence Staff Capability uh, in the New Labour era, very opportune ap- ap- given the, the circumstances we face today. And Jeremy's going to start us off with his... Uh, a little review of his paper, Defence in a Dangerous World. And then myself and Francis, the co-editors of Defence I, will come in and uh, uh, give some commentary on how this moves forward in the Starmer era. So, uh, Jeremy, can you give us a, a, a sort of insight into your paper and how you see it impacting on uh, Britain's defence posture post the general election? Uh, Thank you, Tim. Yes, well, I I hope at least some people will have read the paper, or will do, but I'll now try and trace it. Uh, The paper argues, basically, that that mismanagement of defence over a long period has left us facing a very turbulent and dangerous world in a very precarious position. Uh, My belief is that defence has been discussed in the wrong, even sometimes in rather banal terms. Uh, Central to this has been a very dishonest debate about very small fractions of GDP, an unstable measure and one that's very easy to manipulate. It has centred on manpower levels, visible big ticket items, the nuclear deterrent, aircraft carriers, fifth generation aircraft, but not on our ability to operate and sustain them in operations. Meanwhile, manpower is steadily declining, even below the government's currently agreed levels, with more people leaving than joining, often because of the undue pressure on them. The failure to order timely replacements for obsolescent or even obsolete equipment has led to the disposal of equipment without replacement. A sharp fall in industrial and engineering capacity has reduced our ability to produce equipment in a timely and quite frequently in an effective fashion, and reduced our ability to support repair and sustain it in operational service. Even the integrity and continuity of the nuclear deterrent is now threatened by these failures. Moreover, we've allowed ourselves to become dependent on offshore producers for some important items with concomitant risk. We have deliberately allowed our defence industrial and engineering capability to wither, and we're not in a position to expand rapidly as we were in the 1930s. Governments have also failed to explain honestly to our population the position in which we find ourselves. Now, in my paper, I listed a number of key components of military capability which lie outside our direct military establishment. And these, I think, make it clear that in any serious conflict, defence is a whole nation responsibility. But we have failed to explain this to anybody. The result is a huge decline in our combat readiness, despite the aspirational, almost delusional, recent defence reviews. We're suffering from a lack of realism and a lack of honesty about our position. Of course, we developed over several decades a market-based economy focused more than most of our allies on maximising shareholder return, which may well be incapable of addressing the requirement for surge production without government intervention. This is a pretty grim picture, especially given the current current threatening global security landscape and the seeming political instability of some of our most important NATO allies. I suppose my chief message is that a nation of 68 million people cannot be defended by a mere 0.3% of its population in uniform. It requires a substantial infrastructure and the ability to surge both production and manpower to cope with any serious conflict, uh, the expenditure of ammunition and the losses that it incurs. It needs the support and capacity of the whole nation. Governments must have the courage to be both honest and clear. You can't cure a problem if you don't identify it accurately. A new government will naturally wish to conduct a defence review, but its first call must surely be to close the vital gaps in our present capability before going further. Whatever your ambitions for the future, wars have to be fought with what you've actually got and not with aspirations. 
You can't solve a problem if you haven't accurately defined it. That's a fairly brief summary, Tim, but I hope it gives a flavour. No, I think it's uh, to the point. And um, given where we are with a, a new de Defence Secretary about to be appointed this afternoon by the Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister, um, it's very, very uh, opportune that we look at how the the new government transitions from the old policies, how they frame the narrative of, of what they're going to do and how they resolve the problems you've identified. Um, now, the, the Labour Party have criticised the defence reviews in the past. Um, it remains to be seen how they can uh, form a narrative of change that actually delivers real change in defence, uh, some of the things you've talked about, because there is a innate bureaucratic inertia that um, that is ingrained in parts of our armed forces and military defence against that kind of change. Uh, perhaps, Francis, you can give us some idea as to what, what are the, how do you overcome that inertia to deliver the kind of things that uh, Jeremy's talked about? And I'm, I'm aware people will say, uh, if you go in like a little China shop, uh, you will alienate too many people and and so forth. Um, coming back to what Jeremy said and what you just said, Tim, as well, the problem is the inertia, the degree to which people do not take decisions, do not want to take decisions, and in fact almost seem to get promoted because they don't take decisions, that culture has to change. And it will be required, the Secretary of State just saying, the, the political equivalent of fix men, let's follow me. Not guidance. We've had several industrial strategies and strategies where people have said um, competition should not be the only tool. Now, as far as I can see, no one has actually said in a number of areas, uh, which we could talk about at length, they're still running competitions. Um, you're still seeing the services. And again, Jeremy referred to um, uh, a lot of dependence on overseas suppliers. You know, the services love buying American, not necessarily because the equipment's any good, Definitely not because it's cheaper. It isn't. But they get an awful lot of travel to some quite nice places in the States. And um, this this is not, not something new. I've seen it for 25 years. And this type of addiction to air miles collection has just got to be ended by the Secretary of State. And just saying, you know, if, if a US company says they can only brief about their product in secure facilities in the States, fine, we're not interested. It's as simple as that. But it is going to require radical yes drastic and fast action and now i am interested that originally labor said they were going to have a year-long defense review come their manifesto it said in under a year i will put my marker on this i think they need their defense review in uh, done within six weeks and quite frankly that should not prove to be difficult because the key facts and figures are all there out in the open um and it actually requires and we're assuming at this stage that it will be john healy and let us hope above hope that Keir Starmer doesn't find another job for John Healy, because then the issue of having a inexperienced or ill-experienced defence team will haunt us and haunt him. He's going to have to make decisions, not on the hoof, but in, in weeks, not months, and certainly not years. Because if you think about it, some of those decisions, let us say, building a new frigate maintenance hall at Devonport, which is going to be needed, that is the work of two to three years. So if you take a year and a half to decide what to do, that's the entire five-year parliament done. So uh, to use the Churchillian expression, action this day. Well, it, it might be that uh, they be, may be forced to action because, of course, uh, the new, we believe the new Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves, um, she's talked about having a budget in September. And uh, So lots of the financial decisions will be included in the budget, the spending plans, that they will be delivered to the Ministry of Defence and they will have to make those decisions within that, those envelopes and that will force them to make decisions. Yes, but then, and actually along these lines, because I had been hearing people going, God, you know, will they become an in-cut defence? Um, in what? Uh, two days' time, three days' time, uh, Keir Starmer is going to be in DC for the NATO 75th anniversary. Um, he will be asked very pointed questions by probably every other uh, head of state, premier there, and especially Joe Biden, if you can remember where he is. Um, apropos of, by the way, mate, you're not cutting the defence budget, are you? He will not be able to prevaricate and say, we'll have to do things when the time is right and whatever. He will be put on the spot. And then when you've got the uh, European Political um, Assembly of Blenheim Palace in about 10, 11 days' time, 
without a shadow of doubt, the same questions will be asked. And I suspect he will be required to make a public statement saying there will be no cuts to the defence budget. The defence budget is ring fenced. Um, this will be the first test because um, come, here I am in Leafy and Damp, North London, full of um, uh, deep Starmer lawyer supporters. They will be very disappointed if they are suddenly told that the um, defence is off limits and other areas potentially around social security and stuff like that and social care have to bear the brunt. So it's going to be a real test, but he will not be able to fob off the other NATO leaders with, trust me, it'll be OK. He will have to say, yes, defence is safe. Um, Jeremy, could you give us some sort of insights as to how the Ministry of Defence, the armed forces react to change and having new political masters giving them new directions? How how how, how do they sort of react to that? And what do you see the, the machine reacting to the, the, the new regime we have now? Uh, well, in a word, badly. Um, the, the, at the moment, I imagine they're all busy writing briefs uh, to be handed to new ministers, if indeed they've not already done so, um, both the military uh, element uh, and the um, uh, official element. Uh, and those briefs, uh, if the tradition is any guide, will be mostly devoted to defending the positions that they've got. They won't, uh, or very unlikely, uh, to produce dramatic uh, and new solutions. They're almost certain uh, to follow the existing bureaucracy and produce uh, defences of the positions they're in, none of which will be particularly helpful uh, to a new Secretary of State. I can see Francis is bursting to say something. So, Well, I, I just wanted to say uh, along those lines, Jeremy, of interest potentially, speaking to someone uh, outside of doing work at a uh, main building over the last six months, they said they were amazed the degree to which there was very little work seemingly going on inside main building, preparing for what was obviously going to be a new government. And what work there was, to speak precisely to your point, was let's get the old PowerPoints. We will change a few um, program names. We'll change some concept names. But basically digging themselves in. So the Navy is still global Britain, Indo-Pacific tilt. Um, the, the Army is the warfighting division. Um, these concepts which came out in the last couple of defence reviews, which you can see, A, we can't fulfil, and B, it is unlikely, even with the most optimistic spending profiles, we won't be able to fulfil. These are the lines they will still uh, fight and die on, and which, um, so, so my interlocutor was saying, you know, they have not understood that actually there is going to have to be a massive, big broom sweeping clean. Well, I, I agree. Um, and in fact, uh, the defence views on which they're basing their thinking are the ones to which I referred as being uh, delusional. Um, and <clears throat> I don't see how we're going to break out of that with the existing people in post. They will be writing briefs, they'll have to. Um, but I imagine that those will be simply uh, repetitions of what's already the existing thinking, none of which will be at all helpful. And the question is uh, whether the Labour team have got a sufficient vision about it all to be able to rattle that cage really firmly and quickly. No, I agree wholeheartedly. And, you know, there, there is the issue of uh, looking at the service chiefs. Well, Chief General Staff is very recently in post. Um, would you replace General Walker so early on? I suspect you wouldn't. Um, as Chief Marshal Rich Knighton, he's also relatively recent in post. Um, would it, so he, here is the thing, at one level I would agree entirely, have you got people in post who you can say, look, status quo is gone, right? All of the stuff, these big documents, nope, they are not of relevance and they were wrong at the time. Will you implement? Um, and there, of course, there's one school of thought that says, yeah, you want to get fresh faces, fresh thoughts, fresh thinking in. Um, uh, I suspect what they will do is wait and see, and if they detect any recidivism, any clawing uh, refusal to move, that's when potentially I would say it's um, uh, pour encourager les autres, um, uh, sacrificial uh, sackings. Um, I think as importantly is going to be the issue of senior civil servants. And got to say, there's been an awful lot about the fact that there needs to be a new permanent secretary. Um, and a number of people within the current permanent secretary's team do have to be got rid of because they would be a sheet anchor on any reform of the MOD. 
I mean, it's quite it's quite interesting how um, when you have a change of regime, the degree to which your new political masters are prepared to pull back the carpet and show how the foundations are rotten. Now, uh, the new government have got you know four, five, six months to do that, and the degree to which they're prepared to do that will will enable them to undermine those arguments that have been put forward by the, those status quo generals, admirals, and air marshals and civil servants. And it, it may seem an arcane point, but um, uh, the, 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 part, the role that Parliament can play in that by inquiring and calling witnesses and making these people uh, you know, come before them and, and atone for their sins is, is, is perhaps, you know, has to be done in parallel to, to expose the, the, the rotten foundations at the same time as you're trying to build a new house. Now, um, you, you have to get the foundations right. And so, yes, and I would say trying to, whatever you want to call it, reform, change direction, improve, but still leaving the fundamental problems in place, you will fail. And, you know, I would say we are at a, uh, whether historical analogies are perfect, but we are at a, say, post Boer War, realisation that, OK, we won eventually, but by God, it took casualties and losses. And so you had the army reforms and so forth. I, I think we are in that type of territory. The recognition that especially the last 10 years, maybe the last 15, has undermined UK military capability drastically. And it's not just, and I think one of the problems, and again, speaking to both of your points, you are seeing and hearing from all the service chiefs and senior uh, ranks within them. They're all saying, yeah, look, there's a problem here, but generally th things are okay and we're on the, the right path and we're on the right trajectory. So, you know, don't be so pessimistic. And the answer is actually you've got to be pessimistic. You've got to own up to the fact that, uh, what, Jeremy, how many Type 23s are we able to put to sea at the moment? Three? Three out of nine slash ten. Um, you know, some, some of these, the uh, flying hours are being cut year on year for almost every type of uh, aircraft in UK service. Track miles, which is um, a measure of how active the armoured vehicle fleet of uh, the British Army, largely, um, is. Going down year by year, they, the, the uh, track miles for the major armoured fighting vehicle, Challenger 2, Warrior, the 430 Bulldog fleet, um, they are at 20% of what they were in 2016. 20%. Not replaced by simulation. It's just no one goes out on exercise. Um, so, yeah, it, it's got to be root and branch. And, um, you know, in, coming back to your point, Tim, about, you know, throwing open the curtains, shining lights. Uh, I've said for some time, in a situation like this, you have about six months where you can throw your hands up and go, oh, my God. We found this awful thing behind the, the chest of drawers. This is appalling. After about six months, you own it. And you can't say, so certainly looking into next year, F February next year, you can't suddenly say, oh my God, we've noticed this program is disastrous. The answer is, surely one of the first things you did when going into MOD was you get all of the director land, director C, whatever, you get them to brief you, and you don't just go, oh, Admiral, that's brilliant, thank you. You ask questions, and again, Tim, I would agree a very good way would be to get um, HCDC and the Public Accounts Committee. If you free them up, they can do an awful lot of your work for you. And yeah, it is going to be an, a whole load of embarrassment. And in effect, for the reform to happen, the three current service chiefs, four if you include Strategic Command, which I'm not sure is a service, um, they have pretty much got to... Uh, peach on all of their uh, predecessors, two to three predecessors. So General Walker has basically got to start saying what Patrick Sanders did wrong, also what Mark Carlton Smith did wrong, and Nick Carter before him. Now, this may result in loss of invitations to rifles dinner nights um, and not being able to see the ceremony of the keys of the Tower of London, but it's probably what's required. And it's recognising the problems go back not just two years, they go back a decade, maybe more. Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure it'll get me off several Christmas card lists uh, to ag agree publicly with Francis, but uh, nevertheless, I, I, I must. Um, the, I have the impression that the, the uh, Chief of Defence Staff is one of the world's great optimists. Um, but uh, it must be clear to all the Chiefs of Staff 
that however much they may love and want to hang on to the roles that they think they've got, they actually can't. Not they can't because they're not allowed to, they can't because they don't have the capability so to do, and they're not going to get it. Uh, so there has to be this dramatic thinking. Uh, I think it's, uh, the uh, HCDC obviously has a key role to play, but it's also very important that the government changes the habit of uh, decays and actually listens to what the HCDC say, um, because they're not being inclined to do so by and large. Uh, and it's also important, of course, that the officials uh, come out of their hutches and actually uh, start speaking truth to power. Uh, all of these things have got to happen, and they've got to happen quickly, and it means breaking long-formed habits. Uh, I don't know if they can do it, quite frankly. Uh, I, I'm sure you could sweep uh, the whole lot out and start again, but that has its downside as well. Uh, and they're, they're not all stupid, the chief stuff, by any manner of means. Um, but, but to come back to your point, we, you know, this one of uh, Indo-Pacific tilt, with the reasonable na size Navy we believe we will have, we do not have the capability to be anything of militarily importance in the Pacific, and also to assume our roles where actually there is a, a threat, which is the North Atlantic. Um, and, the, and the same for the other two services. They're, they have uh, great plans, but the reasonable size you can expect for our services, they cannot achieve. And I think it was Rob Johnson, the uh, head of the assurance unit, brought in to think the unthinkable, to challenge groupthink, and he's leaving because the system has basically uh, formed ranks against him. And he's just said, look, got to cut your cloth to see to your coat. And we we haven't been in the at least the last, I don't know, Tim, three defence reviews? Four? Would we say the last serious defence review in terms of it was reasonable in its outlook was 97? But then it wasn't funded properly. But it, its outlook was actually coherent and rational. Yes, well, I, I, I agree with that. Um, the the uh, problem is, it seems to me, that uh, they have been encouraged by recent defence reviews uh, to think uh, to think big, for want of a better word. Um, but they can't even man and operate the forces that they have got. Uh, now, that's a uh, fault, but that doesn't lie entirely within the individual services. It lies within the whole infrastructure business that I briefly talked about in the, the list of component parts of military capability. In other words, it's a national problem as well as a service problem. Uh, <coughs> and I'm not at all sure that our economy, as it's currently formed and directed, can deal with that without severe government pressure being exerted on it. And that will require the Treasury being taken largely out of the loop. Because the Treasury, uh, a bit like the, well, it's a, well, the definition of cynic is someone who knows the cost of everything and the value of nothing. Or the old saying about the Bourbon royal family in France, they learnt nothing and forgot nothing. I mean, we have been reporting on Defence Side about the current spending round, which is going on as, or went on a few weeks before the election was called, and how, um, from what we understand, the Ministry of Defence was instructed to generate this is by the Treasury, £3 billion of in-year efficiency savings. Now, this is uh, uh, going to be a massive shock. And going back to your point, Jeremy, about protecting the current force, how do you impose £3 billion of efficiency savings and preserve the current force? This is where the, 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 the crunch we're, we're talking about may come within weeks if this, is, if this comes to pass. Uh, so... Um, Jeremy, can you give us some insight as to how you break out of that cycle of having, you know, in your efficiency savings and still um, try and protect the current force? Can you? One of the first, well, one of the first things you have to do is stop calling them efficiency savings, of course, because they're nothing of the kind. They're, they're capability reductions, invariably. Uh, nobody in the MOD sees efficiency as doing more with what you've got. They see it as spending less, irrespective. Uh, of what you get. Uh, I don't think that there is a machine uh, within the ministry, so please remember that I'm long out of it, um, for addressing these kind of problems in a rational fashion. Um, but that said, uh, what is the point of the government talking about protecting the defence, or for that matter, any other public service budget, and, and then the Treasury wading in uh, and wielding an axe uh, halfway through the year or halfway through the round? Uh, there has to be some much better control of the Treasury uh, than we have uh, seen in certainly in my lifetime. 
But this, this then is the, 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 the wonderful problem, I use the term sarcastically, um, it's a never-ending cycle. Uh, the Treasury says the MOD is wasteful, inefficient, and they mess things up and they go wildly over budget. And then the MOD says, well, hang on, we have to do annularity, we have to go through annual budget cycles, which means we spend six, seven months of the year presenting budget cases, which then it wastes money. It's far less efficient than multi-year procurement, multi-year budgeting, and so forth. And the Treasury say, yeah, but we don't give you the multi-year authority because we know you'll waste the money. And so it requires, as it were, an Alexander the Great to cut the Gordian knot to say, both of you are right and both of you are completely wrong. Um, and if John Healy has any pull with Keir Starmer, and he's been a loyal Starmer, right? He could, the, the best thing he could do that wouldn't actually cost any money, as in suitcases being taken across Whitehall, would be to get some degree of multi-year budget authority from the Treasury, approved by the Prime Minister, um, on the acceptance that if the MOD mess it up and play the games they have since the Levine reforms, that multi-year authority will be rescinded. But if he could get multi-year budget authority, so procurement and planning, infrastructure, training, whatever, across more than a year, three years, five years, which is the case in much of Western Europe, he would have achieved a massive change. Well, I, I agree. I also suddenly occurs to me in listening to this <clears throat> that in almost every other public service department uh, could be having the same discussion. Um, and in other words, the machine is broken. Yes. Uh, you know, from the top down. Uh, and the need for that kind of reform goes well beyond the Ministry of Defence. And I, th I, I think, sadly, some of the recent uh, interviews with the almost certain new Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, says she is so happy she started her life in the Treasury and is delighted to be back in the, the bosom of the, the, the ministry, the department she loves. And I have to say, to me, that doesn't bode well in terms of reform of the Treasury. Now, now Jeremy, you talked about in your, your introduction about how this is a political and societal problem. And in your paper, you describe uh, how Britain and, and West European NATO societies have, have not been willing to bear the burden of defence. Now, uh, in the election, defence was a bit of a non-issue, apart from this sort of um, dancing around this 2.5 issue and the Tories trying to prove that they're more macho on defence because they've set a target, all that kind of stuff. But uh, how do we get our politicians to realise this? Because they, they, as Francis has mentioned, they are... Um, they are the willing partners in the delusion of the service chiefs. How do we get them to um, face up to this stuff? Because they love going to AUKUS meetings or NATO meetings and, and grandstanding it and boasting about how they have more aircraft carriers and more 2.5% than anybody else. How do we get them to accept that this is you know, where we are? Um, with great difficulty. Uh, the, what, of course, one needs to remember the members of parliament, and I think there are around about half of them are going to be first timers in the, uh, in, in the um, House of Parliament, which presents some considerable difference, are members of this uh, large chunk of population that we're talking about. Um, and you've got to be very old uh, to have even the vaguest memories of serious combat for the United Kingdom uh, and what it involves and what it implies. Um, I was born in 1943, and so by the time I was a sentient being, you know, the last war, major war we've had had gone. Um, most people today have no concept uh, that this uh, sort of strange, broadly speaking, peaceful world in Western Europe that we've enjoyed may be on the point of fracture. I mean, there are 37, I think it is, conflicts going on in the world at the moment, and hundreds of thousands of people a year being killed. Uh, we seem to think we're completely insulated from that, and we may be in for a shock. Uh, I don't know who has the experience, whether it's direct or more likely historical, an understanding to explain that to the public, and which politicians have the courage uh, to actually be honest about it. You may remember, I think it was Junkers who said, uh, well, we politicians, we do know what to do. What we don't know what uh, to do is to get elected after we've done it. Uh, and that's always going to dominate uh, the uh, thoughts of um, most politicians, I imagine. Well, if you've got a 170-seat majority, um, if you can't then do a 
quite drastic, um, you know, right, this is the new direction, there really is no hope. And let me be uber cynical. Do we think Keir Starmer's first uh, defence appearance, will it be in a tank or on an aircraft carrier or in a helicopter? I think tank tends to be the traditional one if you go back to um, uh, Maggie Thatcher and the likes. But how quickly or not will he be seen with, with the, the military? Oh, quite soon, I imagine. Um, um, but, but that's yet part of this self-delusion business, isn't it, continuing? Uh, it, it, it's not real. It's not addressing the problem. It's actually doing what you just said. It's boasting um, about an empty vessel. Uh, yep. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I'm really quite um, sceptical about how we're going to change the way in which our politicians look at these things, short of something ghastly actually happening, by which time, of course, may be too late. Um, people like us talk about this all the time. Who listens? Well, I, I, I suspect, and I, I know evidence that um, anyone has put it in these terms, trying to get over to first the Secretary of State for Defence, but then also directly too, because we there's a lot of talk that uh, Keir Starmer will have a sort of uber cabinet above the main cabinet with himself, Angela Rayner, Charles the Exchequer, and uh, uh, it's Pat McFadden. Someone potentially has to brief them and say um, the chances of a NATO uh, member declaring Article Five in an attack on one is an attack on all. It's not a distant prospect. It's actually. Oh, verging towards being a probability. Um, and in the current state, um, British armed forces going up even against, you know, a blunt Russian um, uh, cudgel could see strategic failure. And basically, you know, you want to get re-elected in five years' time, people will remember that, and they'll remember it badly, which brings me back to the, the six-month time when you can actually throw your hands up in shock. If defence is pushed onto the back burner, too difficult, we've got junior doctor strike, we've got this, we've got that. I hate to think the sort of defence and security things in the real world that could crop up. And again, getting through to the likes of the Chancellor, the UK cannot just tell its allies, it's not convenient for us, can you ask us later? We do not have that luxury if our allies come calling. We have to do stuff which will be, from a financial and political point of view, incredibly unwelcome and uh, they will have their supporters. Well, much much should be talked about the budget coming up and slapping the Ministry of Defence around the face and the, the Prime Minister. We have in the Middle East this sort of hot crisis that is on the verge of going bang again. We have uh, this talk about um, the Israelis and the Hezbollah in Lebanon kicking off possible non government evacuation, um, you know, attacks on the British base in Cyprus in a matter of days. So that this is, you know, a chance for uh, the, the, those sort of foreign policy realists to, you know, get in the meeting and get FaceTime with the Prime Minister and say, you know, this stuff is happening and you've got to get a grip of it. And um, how the new National Security Advisor, General of the Royal Marines, Gwyn Jenkins, plays this and gets a voice for the Armed Forces and the Ministry of Defence in Downing Street is perhaps, you know, the most, you know, pressing issue of the hour. Without shadow of doubt, and thinking actually of another aspect of defence power, if that's how you want to play it. Um, looking back over the last years, what used to be called you know, the West Indian Guard ship, um, has been, generally speaking, a, um, a landing ship dock because it's the best platform to deliver uh, relief, disaster relief and so forth. And of course, it's got spare accommodation for extra bodies to help deliver it. We have now seen an absolutely appalling hurricane tear through the Caribbean. Um, uh, countries in the Commonwealth, you know, dependencies hit appallingly badly and and this is no disrespect to the ship in question what have we got out there we've got a river class opv um why because we have three bay class and to put it mildly they can't be in the every place at the same time they are at the moment you could say in the wrong places and so this this comes back to the one of cutting your cloth to suit your coat do we have to declare to uh, commonwealth um, nations in the caribbean that the uk will no longer have a naval presence there this may be one of those 
important decisions that has to be made because it's patently obvious we're not able to sustain it. And no, I don't think it's just about budget. Jeremy, you were in the Ministry of Defence during those first uh, Blair years, and we had the Kosovo, we had East Timor uh, crisis. And how how did that new regime get into the, 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 the rhythm of, of those crises and react to the first time when they had to you know, send troops into action? How, do, how is the, sort of the reality of that impacting on politicians for the first time? How, how does that play out? Well, in this particular, those particular cases, the response, political response was su- surprisingly swift and surprisingly strong. But, of course, they also had the toys to play with, um, which uh, now they don't. Uh, and I think that's what makes it complicated. And in addition to that, uh, and this is rather dangerous territory, um, you were talking about the, the Middle East stuff. We now have within our own country a large chunk of the population who will not countenance um, uh, Britain engaging with, um, you know, with with some of the populations in the Middle East. Um, I'm trying to find a way of saying this so I don't get thrown into jail, but um, th- there are problems facing them now. I think the buzzword is it's divisive issue. Yes, indeed. Right? But we have, we have allowed things to happen without, without thinking about these sorts of consequences. Um, and so I think from a political point of view, it's very much more dangerous um, and difficult and made even more complicated by the fact that even if they come to the conclusion, as they did with Kosovo and so on, that they need to do something, uh, they're, they're rather looking around themselves for things to do it with. Uh, and, and that is probably uh, the, worst situa- the worst of our situation. We have forces of a nominal level of which perhaps half or less are actually readily deployable. Um, Don't- don't you think it's actually quite interesting, Tim, you raised the issue that uh, defence security slash, uh, there was sort of the dog that didn't bark, there were a few uh, outbursts in 2.5, but perversely, and coming back to your original premise, Jeremy, about the fact that defence and security actually has to be a country issue, not just departmental, strangely enough, one of the few, and I think it was almost the first announcement by the former Prime Minister, was his one on national service. Actually, this is the it is the elephant in the room. If we are looking at a change in our defence and security circumstances, which for which I think the evidence is overwhelming, we are not going to be able to resolve our issues with a regular armed forces, and actually some form of national service conscription, which by the way is expanding in mainland Europe on a almost daily basis. This is going to have to be um, not just considered it's probably just going to have to be introduced. And, you know, here we are the day after the, uh, the ele- hours after the election result, the potentially the perverse issue that the first security thing Keir Starmer has to do is take one of the policies from his predecessor and implement it. Well, that comes back to the... the Jeremy, go on. Well, I was going to say that, that, that's interesting, though, because the armed services themselves are likely to be strongly opposed to conscription largely because they don't have the capacity uh, to uh, take in and train uh, large numbers of people on quite complicated um, technology, uh, whilst they're also operating. But then how come so many, I look at, especially towards a country like Finland, now I know you'll say, well, they're they're not operating. Actually, their defence levels are raised massively. The fact that, and they, they prove this, with their reserve system, and by the way, their reserve Infantry units are equipped identically to the regulars. It's, there's no second best. They can put 300,000 troops into the field in under a week. Somehow the training, when you do it properly, and especially the Nordics are doing this, and then people like Poland, it isn't impossible. And it was pointed out to me the other day, that the whole, especially just looking at the army, oh, they don't have the training infrastructure. Well, they're training about 25,000 Ukrainians a year. Now, is that a burden? Yes, of course it is. You know, it, but somehow we're managing to do this. And the question, if you'd asked me about conscription national service 10 years ago, I'd have said, don't be ridiculous. Stupid thing. It was a brilliant, brilliant. It was got rid of, you know, in the 60s. I think we've just reached a time where the old certainties, as you said, Jeremy, have gone. And actually some of the old solutions might have to return. Well, this might come to a head in this ongoing discussion that's going on about what's called the national defence plan. This is a NATO requirement for all allied nations to have an active plan for their um, uh, their armed forces. 
uh, to defend their homelands. Now we have, um, you know, over the past thirty years, dismantled our home defence capability, which was largely based on our reserve forces, the old territorial army, and. Um, Francis mentioned about the Scandinavians and the Finns and their reserve forces. This might be the, the, the sort of the sweet spot through the middle. Um, you know, 30 years ago, the Territorial Army was 86,000 people. Um, you know, having a volunteer reserve force which um, fills that gap, it's not conscription, but it is a wider engagement of society in defence. Um, that is, um, you know, maybe the way, the route through this to um, engage with society and fill the need for home defence. Um, now, the there is ingrained resistance I, I detect in Whitehall and in the Ministry of Defence for any of this, to a certain extent, because it is seen as undermining the nuclear deterrent. It is seen as being, if you admit that your country the homeland will be attacked. Um, you are dispelling the magic aura that the nuclear deterrent provides. Uh, uh, now, Jeremy, how do you see us navigating into that realm and that space and that type of activity? Gosh, well, I, I'm always taking a different view about the nuclear deterrent, which is that the um, paucity of our conventional forces uh, would bring us to the point of nuclear release well before it was justified by uh, any um, overall situation, and that therefore the lack of, of a substantial conventional force underneath the nuclear deterrent weakens the deterrent, it doesn't strengthen it, because we would find ourselves obliged or pushed into first use when the other side didn't need to do so. Uh, and first use would be suicidal. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't entirely buy the idea that a substantial uh, reserve force or um, substantial conventional forces would undermine the deterrent. My personal view is it might very well strengthen it. Um, having said that, um, one of the uh, difficulties about uh, this is that we're, we're most unlikely to get volunteer forces, um, reserve forces of the scale that you just mentioned, it seems to me, uh, which is why we find ourselves confronting the idea of uh, national service or conscription. Um, and I don't think the arguments against that are logical. I think, quite frankly, they're in a funk about it. Um, pe pe people are scared of the idea and are trying to enforce it on an electorate. Um, I mean, remember, the Labour Party only got 34% of the vote uh, in, the, in, the, in the election we just had. Uh, uh, so they're actually more precarious than it, than it, than it might appear. But they, this, yeah, but come. Which basically piss off the, the electorate. Uh, that's not a very, um, not a very um, ideal option for them, I suspect. But this comes back to some of your original uh, thinking, Jeremy, and your pricey, which is <clears throat> the same old, same old continuation. It's brought us to a stage where, and no, this is not just getting the lamp swinging, saying, in my day, dot, dot, dot. But the UK defence capability is at the weakest, and I think it's justifiable. And the fact is, our allies are telling us this as well that they don't think they can rely on the UK anymore. So why then the official line is everything's fine, this is the problem. We ha we collectively, UK, have to think differently and we have to think the unthinkable. Now, coming back to your one, Tim, about uh, the TA, we both know and have experienced the fact that the army, I don't think, has valued the what was the territorial army and is now the army reserve. They've not valued them ever. Um, always viewed as... You know, uh, yeah, we have to have them. Um, we've both been at lunches, Tim, where senior army people have said if they could get rid of the army reserve, the territorials, they would be very, very happy to do so. So I think the, the thinking in the regulars um, has to change dramatically. And if surely Ukraine teaches us anything, it's the forces you first put in combat if there's if it's even half like we've seen in Ukraine, those forces will be pretty much exhausted within six months or eight months. So even if three div was a deployable capable division, which it isn't, within six months, where are the forces to replace it? And this is where, again, I I like the idea of you know rebuilding the and I think there's no problem about calling it the territorial army for a variety of reasons. Um, and I'll just note by the way. 
all of the, the Scandinavian countries called this type of reserve the Home Guard. And um, over here, sadly, this is now associated entirely with Dad's army. Uh, over there, it's almost a point of pride. Um, but we need to get basically a new contract between people and services. If that means you uh, join the territorials and you do eight years and you then have all any university cost wiped out, yeah, do it. Cost would be nugatory to the country as a whole, but if that's what it takes, do it. But I think we have to have this type of thinking radical before we'll get any change. And and yes, Jeremy, I don't disagree at all. You know, how do you sell to a population that believes it's basically safe the idea that actually we aren't really safe and that, uh, you know, things happening in Ukraine, it's not a small country far away of which we know little. We have allies far closer who are experiencing um, Russian threats and bullying almost on a daily basis. And, and you yeah, know, Russian submarines sneaking around the coast and all this stuff. It's not a long way away. It's right next to us. You're more of an optimist than I thought, Francis, if you think that a single division can last uh, for as much as six months, should we find conflict? I, I, was, I was hoping. <laughs> um, Jeremy, you mentioned in your introduction about the role of the defence industry and how it needs to rechange its mindset and business models for this new um, reality. Could you expand a bit on that and Francis come in on how, how you can see that, that all playing out? Well, um, I'm taking myself back now to um, uh, the uh, Defence Industrial Strategy of 2006, um, which um, tried to establish uh, the future for the British defence industry. What it didn't buy, or rather didn't take into account, was that you can't sustain an industrial capacity unless it's got work to do. No, no company that's got shareholders to please is going to keep workers sitting on the sidelines just in case they happen to get an order. They'll shape their workforce to their expectations of work. Uh, and this has produced uh, shrinking workforces in most of our defence industries. Uh, and where we had long gaps in uh, orders of types of equipment, submarines is a good case in point, uh, the workforce has almost dissipated and had to start up again. Uh, so we, we need uh, to understand that if we want to have a defence industry, whether we like it or not, it has to have uh, it has to have work to do, uh, and we're not prepared to accept that. Uh, it's quite striking that the, when the Type 26 comes into service, if it does, it will be something like 24 years since the Navy last accepted a frigate. Uh, well, that's mind-boggling um, when you think that as late as the 1990s, um, we were building um, like two or three Type 23s a year. Uh, so uh, there, there has to be, I think, a, a, a real rethink uh, uh, about this. And the, you cannot expect uh, in our economic model uh, companies, uh, private companies who do defence, uh, to take the load on behalf of the government and the Minister of Defence. They have shareholders who they're obliged um, uh, to give a return to. We need, a, once again, we, are, you know, we have a broken model. We need to refix the model. And this particular one's going to be seriously difficult. And, and to add to your points, Jeremy, I would say one of the issues it brings us back to the Treasury. Um, you know, why has the UK got so little artillery ammunition that to supply for the AS 90s given to Ukraine? We've had to buy it in Germany because the bunkers are empty. And the Treasury says holding stock is basically evil, it's inefficient, um, and you are penalised for holding stock. And we, you know, by the way, we should have just been reminded by the Ukraine war, the sort of levels of ammunition expenditure. It's nothing new. It should have been a reminder. And basically, there needs to, the Prime Minister, it's going to have to come from the Prime Minister telling the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer and then the Treasury, we will hold stock of 155, just pretend we're going to hold 2 million rounds as the base load. And we will buy whatever it is, 50,000, 100,000 rounds a year. And if we cycle our stock through, you know, and yes, the Treasury will say, well, that's bunkers, which we had to depreciate. Oh, God, that's going to cost. It, it's a mindset. And I, I think, again, one of these ones just getting through to the Treasury, unless we can decapitate the Treasury and get it out of the system, which is a, a very attractive option at this stage, um, is especially with things like munitions and support and supplies to the armed forces, there is basically a digital equation. 
Too much doesn't exist. No one has lost a war from having had too much ammunition. A lot of people have lost for not having enough, as the Ukrainians have been showing over the last year. And so just in time for defence does not exist. There was then in the early 2000s, the Americans invented a wonderful new concept to replace just in time. It's called JEDI, which, of course, makes it much better, which is called Just Enough Deliverable Inventory, which at a conference I went to, a US Marine Corps colonel who'd heard it for the first time, rather sarcastically said, JEDI. To me, that stands for Just Enough Dead Infantry. These concepts have just got to be canned. Yeah, look, OK, oh, you can say we have a million Azram air to air missiles. No, of course not. But I think you could open every single bunker in the UK and go, how many have we got? Not enough. And by the way, I would say if you look at how Germany has grabbed this bull by the horns, and you look at the fact that Rheinmetall has now got an 8.5 billion euro multi-year order for 155, and then they're putting another uh, got 15 billion euro order with deal and Namo for uh, rockets and whatever, they've they've understood this. And so, quite frankly, all of those put the 10 billion announced last year for munitions and stocks into a rather sharp focus. And the last I heard of that 10 billion, I was told recently, probably under 500 million has been put on contract. Well, um, the, you know, that reminds me of the uh, fuss about the uh, change from what I think is currently 2.2% of GDP uh, to 2.5%. Uh, and the sort of money that produced uh, doesn't even compare with what we're talking about. You also remind me, actually, that in 1986, when I did the RCDS, we had a lecture from a Treasury official who said to us, you have to remember that in Treasury terms, virtual or defeat is merely a detail. Yeah, well, and uh, this, is, this is something we have got to, as a country, get over. And um, I believe it was... Um, uh, Margaret Thatcher, who in the Falklands, who basically um, said the Treasury will not be in the room during any of the discussions about how to fight the war, because he's, and she said something along the lines of, I will send them the bill afterwards. Jeremy Francis, could we just, we're, we're approaching the end of our, our time, could you just give us a, a bit of a summary of where you think the next you know couple of months will play out, and what are the, the bullet points, you know, one or two key things that need to be addressed? Well, how they play out depends very much, in my opinion, on the way in which the MOD uh, actually approach uh, the new government and the speed with which they do it and the honesty with which they do it. Uh, and uh, I'm not prepared to bet my pension on that. Um, it, it's, it seems to me to be critically important that the incoming government is given an accurate picture and not a, a sort of optimistic and delusional picture. Uh, and my money would be on the latter happening rather than the former. So that's the first thing I'd want to see. Honest appreciation and not uh, a set of boasts. Um, the second thing I would want to do would be to uh, do everything I could uh, to improve the support and sustainability of our existing forces, which in fact is what we've just been talking about really. Um, and I would regard that as extremely urgent, because without it, uh, we can do nothing at all. Uh, so those are the two things that I'd want to see. Uh, um, and then I'd want to see, as I mentioned earlier, a, a change in the status um, of the uh, HCDC, uh, so that uh, the government was obliged to listen, and the Ministry of Defence was prohibited from exhibiting its first reaction to any criticism, which is to deny it. Uh, and uh, if we, even if those three things could be done, that would be a splendid start uh, whilst we actually get on with planning the future. But remember, the, 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 the future may never come unless we sort out the present. Uh, along, adding to, to Jeremy's points, um, self-deception, um, everything's fine. If the Labour team don't know that that is just... It's not true... If they give in to the, the blandishments, oh, no, I think you've been misinformed, Minister, they've lost day one. They have weeks or very short number of months to get the key building blocks in place. So the strategic headquarters uh, directing, they've got weeks, not six, eight months. And they, they will have to ride roughshod over a number of interests inside main building and service commands. Um, uh, and they will need to start making some pretty big decisions. 
And uh, as I say, the, the idea that we're going to have a review where let's go out and have seminars in RUSI and Chatham House and we mull over if defence was a colour, what colour? No, you don't need that. The, the review pretty much writes itself as to what the key issues are for the UK. And um, quite frankly, as when uh, John Healy, we see him on the steps outside the South uh, Door, people say, well, what should he do in the first week? Announce a new fund for the uh, upgrade and upkeep of every single single uh, living accommodation and married quarters across the services, multi-billion pound, um, get rid of pay as you dine, stop charging people for their barracks. You know, if you're getting people, if you want people to serve, the idea that you then charge them for their accommodation and food, come on, it's this is penny pinching. That type of thing, I'm not going to say will solve every aspect of the services recruiting or retention. It's a bloody good place to start. Right, gentlemen. Um, sober assessment there. Um, perhaps one of the, the good things that we can look forward to is that Defence and Iron City Forum will be covering these issues in depth in the coming weeks and months. Um, Defence Eye every week is, is reporting on... Um, the, the issues of UK defence, and we'll be giving a, a, a strong focus on what's happening to the Ministry of Defence, John Healy and the new government. And City Forum, of course, holds its um, regular events, first smart uh, defence event in October to allow um, us to get a handle on what's going on. So thank you for your insights, and uh, we will no doubt be seeing you all again in the future.